webinar. Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Transforming DCS Migrations into a Roadmap for the Future. This webinar is co-hosted by ISA and Maverick Technologies. I'm Michaela Cooper with ISA, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. But before we get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's webinar. Uh, first, in regards to the poll questions and question and answer session, we do have four poll questions that will pop up throughout the webinar. Uh, when these poll questions pop up, we ask that you enter your answer into the poll feature that's on the WebEx navigation, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, this is completely anonymous, so feel free to join in and engage with us. Uh, we want to make this webinar as engaging as possible. We do also have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. And to submit your questions, you'll simply want to type them into the Q&A box that's on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, even though the Q&A session is at the end of this webinar, you can submit your questions at any time, uh, beginning, middle, throughout. Um, if you have a miscellaneous question for me, the host, just submit those into the chat toolbox. Uh, we want to reserve the Q&A box just for the Q&A session, so uh, submit those other questions into me using the chat box. Um, if we get an overwhelming amount of questions and we do not get a chance to respond to your question at the end, um, then you can reach out to the presenter and contact him directly and his information will be given at the end of this webinar. Second, for those of you who did just join, make sure you are on mute. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, refer to the confirmation email I sent to you, or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you'll see a tab labeled uh, Event Info, and some of those connection instructions are included there as well. Um, please remain on mute. We want, to we want to be respectful to the presenter and allow him to present this webinar. Additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey should pop up in your browser. It's a short survey, probably will take you uh, about 60 to 90 seconds to take it. Uh, we really take the information uh, that's given to us in those surveys. We look at it, we really want to know your feedback. So please just take a moment to uh, take the survey at the end of this webinar. Okay, I think that takes care of some of our housekeeping matters. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Tim Gellner. He is a senior consultant at Maverick Technologies. Uh, he's control, control systems engineer with 20 years experience in discrete manufacturing, continuous process control, manufacturing intelligence, control system assessment, and migration planning. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Systems and Control Engineering from the University of West Florida. Welcome, Tim. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pass things off to Tim. He's going to present our webinar, um, and I will pass the baton over to him. All right. Thank you, Michaela, and thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining us. I, I appreciate you taking the, the time out of your out of your day to uh to join us and and I, I hope that the um, information that, that we're attempting to pass on is, is of value. Um, one thing I will note is that my my presentations are generally not just just a picture and, and me speaking to a picture. I I'm the type that likes to uh add the, the salient points to the presentation, so I apologize if there's too much text in the slides. So moving moving forward, what we're going to look at is we're, we're really going to look at, at this as a, a holistic methodology uh, for DCS migration. Um, and, and that methodology, we're going to look at assessing the current state of your automation program as a whole, determining the future state, implementing that that program a few things to consider in in moving forward with it and then we're going to kind of switch gears and and look at the uh, the OT IT divide 
and uh, the OTIT convergence and, and what that, that means for the, the future of, of our industry, the, the automation industry. Um, and then the QA ses session and, and the wrap up. So, get there we go. So to start this off, there was a, a white paper that that was written by uh, Paul Gillespie some years ago concerning return of investment on on capital spending, and a couple of the items that that were in that white paper really help frame uh, this presentation. And and of those, you know, the one thing that that he said when you're when you're going through and and looking for ROI on on these capital expenditures is, you know, not to inadvertently suboptimize optimize parts of your business, and that you need to focus holistically on the entire enterprise, particularly at the beginning of the program. And and it's that it's that holistic uh, look at the at the program that that we're going to look at initially here. And then he said, don't get drawn into the trap of piecemeal solutions that, that won't integrate vertically or horizontally. The, uh, the nature of, of the business now is that the data is, is, is king and we need to make sure that, that we have the ability when we, when we put these systems in that we can get what we need out of it to satisfy the future requirements. So those are two very important points. And then the, the other one is, is the subject of regret capital, and in the, in essence, you know the the idea is that if you're laser focused on just just doing a, a a migration of a DCS system, you might miss some of the bigger the bigger facts, the bigger picture that formulate the the future state, and end up with something that you have to to undo or replace in order to get a, a more fully integrated system. So those were those were two very key points that that draw right into into what we're talking about. So to start off, a plant-wide DCS migration, it's a multi-million dollar multi-year investment. It affects the business for years or decades to come. And with the magnitude of that investment, and the impact on on the 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 uh, on the company and the plant for for several years, it, it's a good idea to take that that DCS migration and, and take a step back and say, well, the DCS migration is our immediate goal, but when we look at our overall controls program, you know, what are where do we stand now, and where do we want to go in the future, and how do we make that that DCS migration fit into that overall plan? So, what we're really wanting to do here is is look at how we develop that that strategy that gets us from where we are to where we want to be in in five or ten years. So, the first poll question, uh, just to get a, a feel for where everybody is is, you know, are you currently planning a, a DCS migration project? And I'll, I'll wait for, for some of the responses before I move on. While we wait for that, we'll, I'll just go ahead and, and we'll move to the to the next topic. Okay, so 43% said, yeah, you're currently planning. 55% said no. So it's a it's a, a pretty pretty even split. And and for those who are are not necessarily planning. A, a DCS migration at this time. This concept of of analyzing your current state of your your controls program is still as valid for many other other projects that that you may be uh, engaged in. Uh, just right now, I'm 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 
presenting this this webinar from a customer site where we're we are engaged in actually using this process but not for DCS migration we're looking at an MES implementation so you know we start we start with a, a standard model for the for the assessment program and um, in this in this instance it encompasses five steps so the first step is the pre-planning phase you want to determine the scope and schedule of the assessment refine the model and identify the team so in the case of the DCS um, migration we're going to be really tied into the into the control systems assessment and you know where we want to go from there and we're going to look at, at items that surround that and we'll I'll go into to more detail as we go but um, in the case of, of implementing this for our current customer you know included in this is we've got considerations with the ERP and other considerations that, that fold into the model so the model is not something here that's that's rigid it, it it's whatever fits your needs for for what you're doing so it can be scaled up or scaled down so this the first step as I said is 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 the pre-planning so we need to just determine the scope and schedule of the assessment refine the model and identify the team uh, the second step is the current state of assessment and this is a deep dive into the various aspects of the current systems procedures and entities that make up or interact with the automation and controls program and we want to describe and document the as-is state and I know this is probably dis difficult to see there's a, a lot on the slide but you know we're, we're looking at things of all the aspects of the control system we're looking at our design documentation standards cybersecurity cost specification and procurement and implementation and we want to understand not only within those groups how what our current state is but we also want, want to understand what interactions between say OT and IT might be and how that might be improved um, and, and things like that so it's, a, it's very much a a, a very holistic hence the name uh, look at, at the current state of the the automation program the third step is to analyze the result of the of the assessment within the context of determining what works and what doesn't a common analysis for tool analysis tool for this is is a SWOT analysis and there's several that can be used this is just one that that I use and that's the strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats are the are the four four things that make up the acronym SWAT so in this the strengths and weaknesses are considered to be internal and uh, the opportunities and threats are considered external so for the purposes of this analysis the external portions of the analysis from the point of view of operations may be the interaction with IT or procurement or vendors and vice versa so we're not only looking at, at what we do but we're looking at, at how we interact with with other entities and how those things might be improved some of the things we're looking for out of out of this this analysis is we want to expose possibilities for new efforts or solutions to problems we want to formulate recommendations for improvement determine where change is possible provide an inventory of strengths and weaknesses which can reveal priorities as well as possibilities so we're really trying to get a lot of information that we can use to baseline where we are as as we develop our future state and then the fourth step is to develop the future state in this step we're going to take a long view of the business and the and the industry to determine what systems can be implemented over time that will ful fulfill the known or perceived future requirements and we'll do additional analysis to identify gaps and associated risks in the between the current and future states you know and we'll do you know the gap analysis 
failure modes and effect analysis, and those types of things that, that really start to shake out where we really need to concentrate our efforts. And then the fifth step is, is the step in which we act upon what we've done in, in the previous steps. And at this point, you know, we, we're, we have developed a backing documentation. We, we've implemented requirements. So when we move into the DCS migration phase, we have gotten a lot of the background work done and we can hit the ground running and, and save some time and, and cut some of the, the costs and schedules. So when we when we look at the, the current state assessment, this is typically the, the most difficult part of the of the whole thing because it there's really a lot to look at. Um, and and it's really important that we get the right people involved in this assessment. So in this case, we would be looking at at our, our OT people, the engineering. Uh, IT, document control, procurement, finance, planning, operations, you know, plant management. Everyone needs to have a voice in this current state because everyone has a perspective of how everyone else's piece of the business is operating and it's, it's that interaction that's really going to show you know, where, where we have room for improvement or, or not what works real well. So the the holistic assessment, we must have the cross-functional team up front. We're going to, in the planning phase, we're going, to, we're going to assign specific tasks and we're going to create a schedule. If we don't have tasks and schedules, then we have an open-ended process here that probably will just fade away. So we really have to be able to, to treat this as a, an internal project that that moves us through all of these elements so that we can get to the end. Uh, it, it has to be analytical. You know, we're, we're not, we want to be, be very analytical, comprehensive, and objective. Those are, are probably the three, the three key pieces. We're really wanting to take a, a good overall look. And one thing that, that you find is, you know, you always come up with, well, you know, we've always done it that way. But the questions become why? And is there some way that we can improve it? So getting those, those interactions and, and that analysis is, is what's, what's key. And then we have to, it has to be fully documented. Uh, we need to be able to draw conclusions and we need to evaluate the conclusions and support them. So we need that documentation. And that, that kind of moves us on, on down the path. Um, I'll go through a few of the other items here. When we talk about control systems, there's a whole host of things that, that we have to look at in there. And in that case, we want to do a, a complete survey of everything that we have, all the systems in the plant, the PLCs, the DCSs. We want to know what type they are, what firmware they are, the I.O. counts, the interfaces, protocols. And just as importantly, we need to know where they are in, in their life cycle. How many things have we got that are not supported, that are, uh, that are obsoleted by the OEMs? And, and how much longer are we going to use them before we, we have to replace them? So those are all very important things that, that we have to understand about the, our future state. Another important thing moving forward is the data, data model. You know, we have a tremendous amount of data that, that can be generated from the process control system. And we have to understand that, you know, what are we doing with that data right now? And when we collect it, where does it go? And who uses it? And what are they using it for? So you, you have to understand all of these things and document them so that now we can, we can take a look at it and, and see where our next step resides. Uh, some of the other things that, you know, just off the top of my head that, that we need to look at, the, the network architecture. You know, with the, uh, it's important that, that we really take a hard look at, at our existing network architecture. Is it, 
is it compliant with secure network designs? Uh, you know, things like ISA 62443, and those things that, that we can either improve upon or, or at least in the current state we, I, we understand that no, we're not necessarily there, but in the future state that's where we want to be. Um, important things are standards. We need to we need to understand what those IT and OT boundaries currently are. You know what what are the IT guys taking care of? What are the OT guys taking care of? And and where's that that line in between? Other things: controls philosophy, graphics philosophy, alarm rationalization, protocols, platforms. All of these things we really need to understand how we do them now. Do we have formalized standards for them, and if not, what does it take to develop those as we move forward? We want to look at, at our design documentation. You know, is our, are our documents up to date? Can we get to them when we need them? Uh, you know, simple things like that. Do we need to maybe look at at automating that documentation program, there's there's a whole host of things that we can look at how we do now, you know, how we do things now, and determine, you know, is this good? Is this something we need to improve upon? Cybersecurity, you know, have has the have we had a, a cyber assessment done with, at our plant? Do we understand where we are there? Do we have policies and procedures in place? And does the OEM that is our, our equipment vendor, do they have recommendations or designs for cybersecurity in, in their in their products? And in specification and procurement, you know, are the requirement specifications that we write, are they really comprehensive? Are they really good? Are they really getting us to where we need for vendors to quote on our projects? And Quote them so that there's there's very little or no you know gray areas that that we have to make a, a, assumptions about. Um, you know, we, and then you know we're going to look at cost and implementation, and this is a really good time to to take a step back and look at your current relationship with your with your OEM. You know. I have a, had a customer uh, a few months ago that, when we were when we were talking about this particular uh, items, he made a comment that said that you know we we've had to surrender to our vendor, and I told him I was going to I was going to use that again, so I just have. Um, but but what he meant was he, they they had no more control over over upgrades over getting software that patches it in a timely fashion thing everything it was all dependent upon what the vendor was was doing and the same with um, their their technical support their licensing model they just had absolutely no leverage over the vendor to Im improve this this symbiotic relationship and uh, and that's so that's something that that's really worthwhile doing here and then in the implementation, the you know, do you have clear, clearly defined roles and responsibilities that you assign to vendors, that you assign to, to OEMs, um, to SIs, and how do you manage your your project? What's your your methodologies and requirements for training? And then how how, how do you handle change manage current change management currently? Because you know. It, when we approach a DCS uh, migration, that change management is going to be very important. So once we've gone through the hard part of, of understanding where we are, we we shift gears now and, and we look to see where we want to go. And and this is this is kind of a, a wide ranging uh, future state development where we need to address the business requirements and the goals and future needs. You know, do we do we need more data? Do we do we 
need better relationships with with um, vendors. What types of things do we need to do in 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 order to to get to where we want to go? Um, it's a good point to, uh, here to uh, refine the the business processes. We're we're looking for agility and efficiency. So when we've done that current state of, of assessment. You know, we've looked at all these interactions in our, our business processes, and we've identified maybe or maybe not, but there could be opportunities there to make, make the, whole, whole, uh, the whole program work better. So those are the types of things that, that we want to look at. We want to look at industry standards, ISA, MESA, NIST. You know, there's a whole, whole host of things out there that we can draw from and start to make sure that, that we're looking at our processes and, and our control system in the same way that people in the industry look at theirs from a standards perspective. And just as importantly, we want to formalize and maintain our own standards for graphics, for programming, and all of those things so that we don't have to develop those when it's after it's time to, imp to use them in defining the, the DCS migration. <clears throat> and the other things that we might want to look at for the future state are, you know, what what kind kind of advanced analytics do we need to use to make our to make our business better? Um, what kind of cybersecurity policies and pro procedures do we implement to meet the growing tide of of cyber threats. And then we also want to look at the, the schedule and, and the budget as we move forward because this is a you know this is a, a process. Some things that we we would want to consider in the control system, again, the cybersecurity. And you can see that this is becoming to be a common thread in this presentation. And, and that's basically because the more exposure that we have of our, our operational technology to the enterprise, the more security we have to implement. Because as we expose that, we're getting deeper and deeper into our, our, our process controls, and we need to make sure that we can ensure that that, that security is, is handled at every level. Um, other things to consider, high-performance graphics, and we'll, later on we'll get into those just a little bit deeper. Um, but, you know, what, what kind of efficiencies operationally can we get if we, if we design our graphics so that our operators have a better situational awareness of, of the process and upsets in the process? You know, those types of things can, can really affect the bottom line. We might want to look at taking advantage of, of the more flexible DCS I.O. architectures out there. Um, you know, traditional strategies for field wiring have been out there for years, but it's costly and, and time consuming. So we might we might look at new types of modular I.O. devices that support moving the that connection into the field closer to devices. Now if we're doing a migration, we we probably already have that field cabling in this and it may not be an option, but there may be other things that we want, we can we can use these types of strategies for that can bring in other pieces of the plant that may not be integrated currently. Alarm rationalization strategies. Um, we would have we would have reviewed that in our current state and identified, you know, we really need to get these alarms under control. And and so that's something that, that we want to incorporate in the future state. You know, those types of things can be can be very, very advantageous. And then we might want to integrate other systems into our into our DCS to get a better unified view of the plant. Um, one recent uh, example of that is, is fire and gas detection. You might, you might 
want to, if you've got a, a process area where you've got gas detectors out there, you've got pull um, showers and and eye pull stations and buildings with, you know, with with fire detection, you might want to integrate that into your DCS so that you can have a specific group or a specific graphic that shows you when things start to, when these types of emergencies start to happen, you've got a, a big overview of where the problems are and, and a better way to um, address it as opposed to having to run over to a fire panel and look at the little display and see see where the problems are and those types of things. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of things that, that we can take take into account for the future state development. And then again, we want to look at, you know, moving towards that data-driven control and decision-making model. So when we get to the, the program implementation phase, everything that we've done to this point is going to uncover specific projects, things that we can do, things that we need to do in order to, to update our, our program. It could be upgrading PLCs, it could be up, upgrading processes, uh, you know, business processes. There's a whole host of things that, that would be identified as, at the end of this that we can now say, okay, these are the things that we've got to do to get to our future state, let's get after them. Um, and the other, the other thing too that is going to come out of this from the perspective of a, a DCS migration is we're going to understand our, our requirements and our standards and, and how that we want this future state DCS to look. So we, we start to, we've done that, that work to get here so now we can start to reduce the, the effort, re increase efficiency and shorten the, the duration when executing front end loading studies for the migration and and other identified projects, which there should be many. So this this all starts to dovetail here. And when we talk about the the front end loading um, for the DCS migration, the front end loading is is what we call it. There's there's several other terms for it out there in the industry. Everybody has something that's a little different, but essentially what you're trying to do is determine the scope, schedule, and budget for this migration, and be able to uh, communicate that in a way that you can justify the capital expense. So there's you know these things typically happen in in a series in in phases, and you know when we do it, it's we're going through normally about three phases, depending upon, you know, where things lie. And the idea behind having gone through this this whole assessment of our our controls and, and automation program gets us to the point where, when we're ready to start this front end loading process, we should have already addressed several things that that fall into this, so that we can we can start to to shrink the the overall time it takes to to do this this these FELs um, you know and I'm I'm just kind of going through the list in the in the FEL1 when you're looking at a, a plus or minus 50% that's just that gives you the the toll gate that says you know is this going to be way too expensive or should we move on to the next part so we're you know you're looking at field and remote surveys, the high-level summary of existing systems, well, we've already done that in our current state objective, our current state of assessment. We have assessed the business objectives and requirements, and so we've, we've done a lot of that, so it, it kind of gets us to the point where, okay, well, we're, we're good, let's, let's move on to the second phase. So we get into the second phase, which is the plus or minus 30 percent. And in this in this phase, we're doing things like field surveys and P&ID boundary reviews. We've already done in our assessment. We know because we did that that extensive current state assessment. We know what we've got out in the field. We know if our P&IDs are up to date, and and we know 
you know, what those boundaries are so that we can, we can really box in what this migration is going to do. Our I.O. summary, we already know that because we've, we've done that work. The next thing that we're going to do is, is when, we, when we looked at our relationship with our, our current OEM, you know, what was that relationship like? And what are the other vendors that we might want to look into? So in this phase, we're going to start identifying those vendors and start getting those comparisons, both technical and cost comparisons, uh, and come up with a master schedule. You know, this is a whole multi-year, multi-phase implementation of this, of this program, but the, the key point is we've done a lot of this to get here and we can, we can shrink this down. <clears throat> and then finally, we get to the plus or minus 10%. Uh, you know, this is the P&I update. Again, we should have this. We've done that. We've done that work. We should have the final I.O. and instrument list. We've done that. We should understand the architecture from, from both the standpoint of, of not only, you know, what we currently have, but where we need to go in order to make that, that architecture one that, that complies with, with cybersecurity and with, you know, with, with the best practices from within our plant so that we get the most out of it. Um, some other things that, that we've, we've kind of done, um, we'll understand those functional descriptions. We'll understand if, if high performance graphics make sense for our implementation and the alarm rationalization. So a lot of this we've already baked into the program and we can now move forward and start start doing the, the actual high, uh, very detailed uh, functional descriptions and requirements. And then of course the, the last piece is the, the actual migration project implementation. And here again, we've done the hard work, so we know what our de detailed functional spec is going to be. There, there will be some some modifications to what our our uh, our standards are. They go into that functional spec, and it more than likely is going to be more OEM specific. Um, and and we we know who we're going to to use for our our new platform at this point. Um, you know, we have, we have the standards, we have the, the database, and you know, we have all of these things that, that we can start and we can march right down through getting the system configuration program, develop the HMI, and go through the FAT and the SAT. And we're really trying to, to shrink this, this whole cost and, and implementation for this migration. Okay, so we've reached the point where we have poll question number two, and that is, do you see value in a holistic review of your controls and automation program? I am not seeing anything come up here, so I don't know if we're executing that right now or not. There it comes. And so we had uh, yes, 90%, 8% no. So, you know, we're 90% of you agree with me completely, and, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, a worthwhile exercise. All right, well, thank you, and we'll move on. So we're, we're to the point here where, where I've got a few things in here that we would consider, that we might want to consider as we, as we look to uh, in, improving our, our overall uh, process controls, our our future state and those things, and and one of them is is high performance graphics. 
Um, the source of the information on this slide is from the ASM Consortium, and that's the Abnormal Situation Management. And in essence, this is their um, their definition. And in in essence, it's it's you know anything that that upsets the process, it can be either a minimal upset or it can lead to a catastrophic you know consequences. Um, and the 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 key here is that the operations team has to be able to have the situational awareness that they can immediately be drawn to what the problems are so that they can affect efficient uh, countermeasures to, to bring things back into control and and safety. And, and those disturbances, they, they can impact production and in more severe cases, it can, it can mess up equipment and hurt people. So we want to make sure that, that our Reaction time to those those upsets is as small as possible, so that we can minimize any any potential effects. And the other thing too is is that you know those those situations change over time in in process control environments. So we under, need to understand you know what are the aspects of that 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 we really need to pay attention to. <clears throat> So I was I was looking at the the National Institute of Standards and Technology and some of their uh, thoughts on on high performance graphics and and those things and actually this is this particular quote I is is was surprising to me and that is the inability of of automated control system and plan operations personnel to to control these abnormal situations in the chemical industry has an economic in, impact of at least twenty billion dollars a year. You know that's that's a lot of money, and that's a lot of a lot of lost production potential, uh, damage to equipment, injuries to people. That if we if we fine tune the way our operators look at the world in the Form of graphics, we we should be able to shrink that and and eliminate some of those those costly events. And high performance graphics are specifically designed to bring the operator's attention right to the things that are are causing problems. You know, in in the years past, the 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 whole advent of of graphics was Wow, we can make these cool 3D tanks, and we can have all these colors, and and we can have this pop up, and we can have all of these other nice, neat things that just look great. But effectively, cloud the the awareness of of what's going on. If an operator has an alarm and he has to hunt on his graphic to see what's going on, then he's lost valuable time. So the the high performance graphics kind of kind of take everything that's working fine and and make it not so recognizable and things that are not so good it brings his attention right to him so we want to we want to narrow that that response time so the other things uh you know that we might want to look at is APC and SPC DCS vendors typically have Tool sets coupled with consulting and engineering services for implementation of, of APC, but you know that's that's a that's a process where to do if your process warrants true APC, it, it takes some investigation. It takes somebody that's very knowledgeable. A lot of times, you might look to systems integrators or in-house to your your process controls people. And, and so that's that's not something that's just a, a you buy it you drop it in it really takes takes some time and that's something that we could look at in that that current state uh, analysis is does that fit do we have places where APC could benefit us now switching gears again um, we're 
we're going to get into the the whole concept of this this OT IT divide. And you know the question is okay, why is there a divide? And in most industrial organizations, IT and OT traditionally have different priorities. For OT, we got to ensure the uptime of the of the production system. We've got to reduce risk. And for that reason, uh, our automation systems tend to run for many years, if not decades. Change is not always good from an OT perspective. But for, in the IT world, innovation is, is key. We've got to keep moving. We've got to keep current. And that, that can lead to continual change and upgrades. So, you know, this difference in priorities kind of helps explain why the OT likes to just, we like to stay in our own world and, and keep everybody else at bay. And one thing that, that kind of illustrates this is, is the differences between uh, IT and OT. You know, different problems, different technologies, different objectives. In the OT world, again, availability is is key. We've got to keep things running. We've got to keep product moving out the door. That's that's how the company stays in business. In the IT world, their prime driver is security. Now, the, the at this particular point in time, you know, this is this is more of a historical perspective. These things are starting to dovetail a little bit, but um, you can see. In essence, is that you know traditionally IT and OT are kind of uh, inversely uh, relation related based upon you know what's what's important to them. And I'm going to go through these uh, slides pretty quickly, and this just highlights some of these these differences in the traditional OT IT you know, real time versus non real time. Uh, robust response time versus yeah, it can it can wait a while. Uh, you know, latency in the I OT world is not acceptable. In the IT world, if it takes you a couple seconds to open an email or something, it's not that huge. In reliability, in the OT world, it's continuous. We're we're always running. We've always got to be able to run. In the IT realm. They can schedule their operation. They can tolerate some occasional failures, but in the OT world, outages are are intolerable. So you know these are some of the the things that that have reinforced that that rift in the past. Risk management in the OT world, we have we're looking at human safety, an impact of loss of life, equipment or product. And we've got to be fault tolerant. In the IT world, traditionally they can, you know, they can they'll lose some data, or and and business operations may be uh, interrupted. But but in in our world of OT, it's it's very real. It's it's and it's very critical that that we keep those things going. So, what has changed? So now we're getting to the point where our OT systems are have a widespread adoption of the uh, industrial Ethernet for process control. So that puts us kind of on the same playing field as the OT guys, and we can use you know some of the same technologies, switches, routers, and things that the OT world uses. It gives us a little bit of economy of scale and and some cost. Benefits, so that's that's one reason, and that that was really the catalyst for the convergence. And then in roles, big data, the industrial Internet of Things, advanced analytics, and those guys are what's really driving this this whole convergence. You know, to, to actually take that all that data that we generate on the plant floor, bring that out, disseminate it across the enterprise, slice it and dice it, so that we understand what's going on. And how we can improve, and, and that's the advanced analytics type thing. 
So that's that's really what's what's driving it. But the need for security now becomes more paramount even than it was before because we're we're diving so deep into our control systems. Okay, quickly, poll question number three. How interested is how interested is your company in implementing IIoT technologies for analytics? And I'm I'm just going to keep moving on as as that uh, as that poll question gets answered. We're starting to get a little bit short on time. So when we talk about the whole OTIT convergence, you know we've got. As, as, as I said before, we've got big data, we've got advanced analytics, we've got cloud storage, we've got the IIoT, and these things have all been instrumental in the rise of the concept of smart manufacturing. And that's, that's really one of the, the big buzzwords today in, in, in all of the, you know, the, the different MESA and ISA and, and everyone. So, you know, what, what is smart manufacturing. Um, here's a, a, a short definition. Smart manufacturing is intended to marry information, technology, and human ingenuity to bring about a rapid revolution in the development and application of manufacturing intelligence to every aspect of business. It will fundamentally change how products are invented, manufactured, shipped, and sold. Okay, so we've got, we're kind of mixed um, from the last poll question. We've got low interest for uh, advanced analytics at 39%, medium 42, 19% high. So that's, that's a pretty good range. So having, having said that, gone through what the definition or one definition of, of smart manufacturing is, Here's some of the things that that are that fall out from that. So we have all this data out there, and we have all this analytics. So we have process data, we have maintenance, we have logistics, we have product data, all with context and all describing the intellectual property of our of our companies, of our processes. It's sensitive data, and for someone who is has malicious intent a reasonable, careful analysis of the data. There's a lot of information in there that could damage the company. So one of the, the fallouts of this whole smart manufacturing is the fact that this new paradigm requires, again, more thorough security at every level. We have to, we have to really stress the, the security of our systems. And here's here's another another consequence. For any analytics to be effective, the data has to be correct. If we don't have correct data, we're not what we're analyzing makes no sense. When we start to do this OTIT convergence that facilitates this whole enterprise-wide consumption of process data, the pressures to deliver good data are going to rise in direct proportion with the number and variety of consumers of the data, which means that those of us in the, in the OT world are going to come under more and more pressure to provide the good data. We're going to have to understand how to provide the data, and we're probably going to have to start scrubbing a lot of the things that we already have. That is no small undertaking, and, and it needs to be addressed when we start to move into this whole OTIT convergence realm. And the last of the poll questions, in what time frame do you envision adopting the big data and advanced analytics model? Okay, we are getting low on time. So I'm going to move on, and this is just a parting thought. Uh, this is from multiple sources that was integrated by Wikibon in, in 2013, and it's the, the proje projected spend and value delivered by Industrial Internet, the IIoT. 
uh, projected to 2020, they they estimate that there will be a $514 billion expenditure to develop that with an expected uh, value delivered at $1.2 billion. So it's coming, but we have to make sure that, that we've done everything that we can to be prepared for it and to understand what the, the consequences are. Ah, so we have a pretty even split on on our time frame for for implementing the uh, advanced analytics. Okay, thank you all for for answering those polls. That was that was very very good information for me. Okay, so are there any any questions? We're we're rolling into about the top of the hour here. So I'm sorry I've gone so long. Um, so if you want to enter your questions in the Q and A box, you can do that. Thanks, Tim. Um, and while those questions are coming in, I just want to remind everybody that we did record today's. Uh, webinar, a lot of you had questions about uh, future playback. We we did record it, so if you missed any portion of it or if you wanted to um, re-watch it or share this with your colleagues, it is being recorded so that way um, you can watch it back again and a link to the recording will be sent to you once we have it live and up on the web. Um, but please go ahead and submit your questions at any time in the Q&A box, and Tim, if you just want to go ahead and kick it off, I already see that we have one one question come in. I don't see it, Michaela. Okay. Um, so this question says, what would you recommend in terms of a review of the system if the system is already mature, i.e., uh, well-defined standards, ASM graphics implemented, alarm rationalization complete, some migration should simply be focused on refreshing hardware. At, at, that, at that level, uh, a lot of that, that assessment is done. If you're, if you're looking at that as, a, as a, uh, a platform from which you want to migrate, I would probably concentrate more on my design documentation and the process around it, you know, are my drawings up to date? Is is everything good to go? And and where do we want to go next? Okay, next question is, are there any standards regarding DCS migrations? No standards that, that I am aware of, and that that's why I think that that it's very important that we we understand our own needs and develop our own standards so that when we move into the migrations, those, that migration is going to fit, fit what we want in our future state. Uh, there may be some standards out there. I, I have not seen them. Okay. Well, um Tim, thank you for a wonderful presentation. We have hit uh, the top of the hour. If we were unable to get to your question, uh, please reach out to Tim. His information is on this slide, and I'll also give it out to you uh, later on today. Um, like I mentioned, when you close out of this webinar, please just take a moment to take the survey that will pop up, and we hope to see you in one of our future webinars. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.